yeah, Fermian measures. Uh, I'm sure you have heard about Borel measures. You have surely heard about, well, you've just heard about Young measures. Uh, you might have heard about Haar measures. Uh, you might even have heard about H measures and Wigner measures, but most likely you will, you will not have heard about uh, what we call Bohmian measures, unless uh, you came to my tutorial on Monday. And actually, to those, to those who were in the tutorial, I partly apologize because they will be rehearing some stuff now where I'm trying to be a little bit more in depth, more of an in depth version of the story. And actually, uh, Bohmian measures is, is a term that we just concocted. Uh, recently, and the purpose of my lecture is to try to convince you that it really makes sense to look at those uh, creatures that we call Bohmian measures. Okay, uh, it's all about quantum mechanics. So let me begin with a very basic equation of quantum mechanics, which actually happens to be my favorite partial differential equation, and that is the Schrodinger equation. So the Schrodinger equation written in a uh, rescale framework is a linear partial differential equation uh, where you have spatial derivatives, so here you have the spatial Laplacian, and you have a first order time derivative, and uh, actually the solution of the equation is a complex value function, and this is partly caused by the fact that here you have the imaginary unit i multiplying the time derivative. And this is not really the complete equation that I wrote because we have also some source term typically which I write in this way. Now let me explain the quantities to you. Well, first of all, there is a parameter entering in the game which is this parameter epsilon which is a positive parameter and in many applications, in particular in the applications that I shall be interested in here, is a small parameter. So think of epsilon as a small parameter. Think of it as something like uh, the ratio of atomistic to macroscopic scales. Okay? Actually, it's called the semi-classical parameter. Uh, then uh, there is the unknown function in the game, which, is, which I call psi, which is the solution of the partial differential equation. And psi is the so-called wave function. Uh, then there is a given prescribed function of, say, of x only, which I call v of x, and this is the given potential. Uh, and this is a real valued function, I should say. Uh, and this, you can think of it as the potential field within which the quantum particle that you are tracking moves, but due to the force of which it moves. Yeah? Uh, okay, then, well, this is a first order partial differential equation in time, so you need an initial condition. Okay, so I prescribe at time t equals zero, I prescribe an initial function, psi sub i. And actually, I should say here that. Uh, I am looking at this equation on full space, say in Rd, so this is a d-dimensional problem as far as position space goes. Well, and time typically is, of course, a positive quantity, but this equation is in some very precise sense time reversible. So you could uh, imagine that t is a real variable. Now, in the sequel, I shall often denote superscripts epsilon, or, or actually write superscripts epsilon in order to make sure that we understand that the unknown or, or the function under consideration depend explicitly on the parameter epsilon. So this is the famous initial value problem for the Schrodinger equation as it was essentially formulated by the physicist Erwin Schrodinger in the year 1926, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, yeah, this is re also referred to as Schrodinger's wave mechanics or quantum mechanical formulation in the Schrodinger picture. Now, there is various other ways of formulating quantum mechanical laws. For example, there is uh, the Heisenberg picture of quantum mechanics. There is the Wigner picture of quantum mechanics. But there is another one, another picture of quantum mechanics, which is maybe 
much less known than, uh, say, the Schrodinger picture, and this is called the Bohm picture of quantum mechanics. Now, before I go into the Bohm picture, let me make a few comments on the Schrodinger equation. I mean, this is a linear partial differential equation, right? Uh, well, it's, it's not constant coefficient. Typically, V depends on X. Still, it's linear, and, you have very, and we have very, very good theories for linear partial differential equations. So, I mean, where is the problem here? Well, typically, although you solve a linear equation, uh, the quantities that you are interested in, the so-called physical observables, are nonlinear quantities. In particular, they are quadratic quantities in the wave function. So maybe the most important physical observable is the position density, or actually density of physical observable. Uh, let me call it rho epsilon, which is again a function of x t, is defined as the square of the absolute value of the wave function. Uh, similarly, the flux density is defined as uh, in the following form. I take epsilon, I multiply it by the imaginary part of gradient psi of x and t multiplied by psi hat of x and t. Well, you can say now why these obscure definitions. Well, once you have these definitions, then you can convince yourself immediately that the conservation law holds. This is like conservation in the, of mass in classical mechanics, fluid dynamics, and all Okay, uh, now once you have defined the position density and the flux density, of course you can define the mean velocity, right? So what is the mean velocity? Let me call it u epsilon of x and t, and this is just defined as the quotient of the flux density and the position density. And this is where Bohm comes in. So Bohm's original idea was uh, to rewrite quantum mechanics in classical mechanics terms. Okay, now what does that mean? Well, once you have the mean velocity, you can, of course, define uh, trajectories of particles. And if this was a classical motion, a classical mechanics motion, you would define the trajectory just in this way, right? And, and you would say, well, x should be a function of, say, an initial value x and time t, so that means x of x and time t equals zero would be the point x in our t. And you would hope that this defines a flow, classical flow. Now, what is the issue here? Well, I should write u epsilon, actually. What is the issue here? Well, the issue uh, when you have, when you consider flows on, say, d-dimensional space, of course, in general, what you need is some regularity to define the right-hand side. And you need regularity in order to make sure that your system of ordinary differential equations uh, has a good solution. Okay. Now, what would you need in the classical case? Well, the classical case, in order to, and classical case that we teach uh, in undergraduate ODEs, what you would need is this to be Lipschitz. Well, you know that if this is a Lipschitz continuous function in the first variable, say continuous in the second, then you get. Uh, locally unique solutions, and you can, can define your flow locally, and so on. Now we have learned some 20 years ago, I suppose, that Lipschitz is not really needed. You can do much, well, you can define flows under much weaker conditions. Uh, so it was uh, due to Lyons and Tipper, so Pierre Louis Lyons and uh, Ron Tiperna, that, well, where well, they showed that basically if this is a W11 function, then you're still okay, and you can define at least in almost everywhere flow. Uh, later on, Ambrosio actually showed that if this function is only PV, that means a bounded variation, then you can all still define a good flow. Now, 
In this case, in the case of what we call Bohmian trajectories here, the situation is completely different. Why? Well, you see, I solved the Schrodinger equation. If I assume that the initial datum and the potential are, say, C infinity functions, then you can convince yourself easily that the wave function is going to be C infinity. Okay, so if uh, psi is C infinity, rho is going to be C infinity, j is going to be C infinity, that means basically the quotient of j and rho will be C infinity wherever it is defined. Okay? But you may have zeros in row. The wave function might have nodes. And you have absolutely no information on what happens at those nodes. Okay. Now, actually, Bohm kind of ignored this problem. And it, was, uh, it wasn't until many years later, I think it was some five, six years ago, that the theorem was proven, which I, call very, which I consider a very interesting theorem. And that was by, that is by Berndl and others. And basically, what they showed is whatever your U is, what, uh, whatever nodes you have, this flow is defined rho i epsilon almost everywhere. What do I mean by rho i epsilon? Well, rho i is just the initial position density. Okay, so give me an initial wave function, solve your Schrodinger equation, uh, set up your, your position density, set up the flux density, compute the uh, initial, uh, compute the, the average velocity, then you can solve this flow problem here uh, in a reasonably good way in the sense of that the trajectories will be defined uh, almost everywhere with respect to the initial position density. So that means in particular you don't have any information on those points which run out of nodes. Uh, which, uh, I mean on those characteristics which should run out of nodes. But they don't exist. I mean, you don't need them anywhere in the theory. Huh? But moreover, also what it tells you is that it happens very, very rarely in this precise sense here that a trajectory of this problem runs into a node. Okay? It can only happen almost every, I mean, on, on zero measure sets with respect to this measure. So, in some sense, this Bohmian trajectory, I mean, Bernal's theorem makes this uh, uh, Bohmian trajectory is well defined. And actually, I should say there is a second part to this theorem. Namely, the second part is that uh, the position density, rho epsilon, at any given time t is nothing but the push forward of the initial density through the flow map x. Okay. And this, well, if you don't know what push forwards mean, means, basically, this is in some sense, and I put here in some sense, a, form, a, a, for, a, a way of saying that uh, rho epsilon satisfies this conservation law. Which, of course, is not surprising because of the definition. Okay. So basically, Bernal's theory, actually Bohm's theory, with Bernal's theorem tells you that, uh, well, you can reasonably well speak of something like quantum trajectories, whatever they would mean in the physical sense. And I have to say, I don't really know what they mean, physically speaking. Yeah? Because... Uh, Originally, we learned that a particle uh, is in quantum mechanics is actually a wave. Yeah? Well, you could say, okay, a wave can be more or less localized, and, and so on. Yeah? So, I mean, but this is the mathematical sense of the Bernal theory. Okay. Uh, let me erase this. Okay. 
Now, uh, when we speak of flows and push forwards, uh, and here in particular we speak of uh, Eulerian flows, which means basically that uh, the that X, capital X, measures the Eulerian trajectories of the flow, we, we might as well speak of the corresponding Lagrangian picture, right? Which, as we know, in fluid dynamics, uh, in many cases, gives additional information. Lagrangian formulation. So how do we get the Lagrangian formulation out of the Eulerian one, well, typically by one more differentiation with respect to time. So basically, what does Lagrangian mean? It means that I introduce uh, as a new variable the time derivative of the Eulerian trajectory. And then, of course, I have to compute through these equations what the equation of motion, what the flow equations now are. Well, and when you convince yourself by differentiation that you simply get u epsilon t plus you get u epsilon in gradient applied to u epsilon. You all know this term from fluid dynamics very well. It's just the convective derivative. Yeah. Well, uh, what can I gain now? I mean, how do I express this term in terms of the quantities that, that I know? Now, there is a... An interesting formulation of quantum mechanics, which is called QHD. And QHD simply means quantum hydrodynamics. And basically the idea is the following. Take your Schrodinger equation. Okay. Write your wave function in in ray, I mean, you have to think that the wave function evaluated at, a, at any given x, at any given time, is just a complex number. You can write a complex number in its radial representation. And the radial representation is, here is the square root of rho epsilon, which is just the absolute value of the function. I need a phase. And for some reason, I rescale the phase by epsilon. It makes sense. Okay, now take this representation. Plug it into the Schrodinger equation, separate real and imaginary parts. Okay, and out comes, of course, an equation for rho and an equation for s. This is actually an exercise which is done in every good quantum physics book. As I said, uh, Monday from page 5 to page 10 somewhere. Right? If it's page 15, I might look for another book actually. Okay, so anyway, what comes out looks like this. Well, of course, you recover the conservation law for the position density, which I've shown you. Uh, more interestingly, you get an equation for, well, you get an equation for the phase. Let me write the equation for the phase. Well, if you had zero here, it would be heaven, right? It would be classical mechanics, right? Unfortunately, quantum mechanics is not so easy. It's not the same as classical mechanics, uh, so it means you get the right hand side, and the right hand side that you get here looks like this. It is epsilon square half, and here is a complicated looking term which looks precisely like this. So it involves the position density, so it couples back into the equation. Well, okay, now keep in mind that you can define the mean velocity just about. Well, but the mean velocity, which you have defined already by being the quotient of the position of the, of the flux density and the position density, is nothing but the gradient of the phase. Okay, so you can write immediately an equation for the gradient of the phase here by just differentiating. Okay, you apply the gradient of this equation, and what you find is that u epsilon t plus u epsilon in gradient applied to u epsilon plus gradient of the external potential v of x is equal to 
epsilon square half gradient Laplace square root of rho divided by square root of LP. So now what you do is this. You see that in my Lagrangian formulation there is precisely this this term here, right? So I just replace it by the other terms. So what I get is that P dot is equal to minus uh, gradient v of x. Well, and now let me define this term. This is actually called, in quantum mechanics, this is called the negative quantum pressure. But, um, excuse me, the negative uh, uh, quantum, yeah, quantum pressure, whichever it is. Is the expression exact? It's only the first couple of terms. Isn't it? Sorry? Exact? Isn't this just the first couple of, is it exact? Or only it's exact. This is exact. exact. That's an exact computation. Okay, there's no approximation in this. So you see what I get here is I get that this is of course a function of x and t. Well, now if you look closely, you will see there is something that you recognize. Now, think of the VB. You see the VB is, an, is formally an order epsilon squared term. Okay, so formally in the limit as epsilon tends to zero, this term goes away, and what remains is just Newtonian projectors. Okay, and this was actually a big, uh, big thing for the defenders of Bohmian mechanics. They said, ah, but it must be okay, because you see the trajectories are all the epsilon square perturbations of Newtonian trajectories. Well, uh, actually I claim, and this is actually where I want to get to in the end, uh, that not all is so well in Bohmian land. Okay? Uh, what well, epsilon square perturbations can actually be pretty bad. Okay, well, uh, if you remember Bernoulli's original theorem, it said that the position density at time t is the push forward of the initial position density through the flow map generated by the Eulerian velocity. Now the question that you can ask yourself now is, well, I have the Lagrangian uh, flow map here. So the Lagrangian flow map would be capital X, P. Yeah? Now, is there a measure that I can write down, or is there a function that I can write down, uh, which satisfies precisely the same properties, except that uh, the push forward charge should now occur under this combined phase space map here? And the answer is yes. And for this, to show you this, I need to define for you an object that we call objects that we call Bohmian measures. Okay. So assume you are given a wave function psi epsilon in L2. Okay, now ah, well, L2 is not going to be good enough. Let me take it in H1. Yeah. Uh, then, of course, you can define uh, the position density, which is going to be in L1. You can convince yourself you can define the current density, which is also going to be in L1. If you have a certain uniformity here, then both of them will be uniformly in L1. Now let me define the following measure. Let me call it beta epsilon. And this is going to be a measure which lives on, on phase space. That is on position momentum space. And I define it in the following way. Rho epsilon of x multiplied by delta of P minus J epsilon of X divided by rho epsilon of X. Now, first of all, you should come here to convince yourself that this is a well-defined measure because where could the problems arise again here? But actually, through the division, there is no problem because you compensate over there. Okay, so you could convince yourself this is a bounded positive measure on 
on position momentum space. And we, we call this measure the Bohmian measure. Now, uh, maybe a second comment is in order. What you realize is that this is already a monokinetic phase space measure. What do I mean by monokinetic? Well, what I mean is that to every position vector x, to every position x, you only have one velocity, which is this one, right? OK, now comes the theorem. And the theorem says, the theorem actually, this theorem is a very simple extension of, Pern uh, of Pernod's theorem. The theorem says that uh, assume now again that psi epsilon is a function of time through the fact that it is a solution of the Schrodinger equation, then I can, of course, set up the Bohmian measure again as a function of time due to the dependence on time of psi. And what I can prove is the following, that first of all, the flow xp is defined almost everywhere with respect to the measure beta epsilon at, the, at time t equals zero. If I write sub i, I always mean initial. Yeah. So it basically means that I can define, of course, that this the flow which I have, this flow here on the Lagrangian manifold, which is defined through x, uh, u i epsilon of x, right? This is a Lagrangian manifold in phase space, and I can prove using Bernoulli theorem that this flow map just pushes forward this, or just moves this, this, this uh, Lagrangian manifold. Okay, and now it becomes more interesting, and beta epsilon of t is the push forward of the initial Bohmian measure through precisely this map. Okay, now here we are at the theory on kinetic, uh, at the conference on kinetic theory, so I should really tell you what this equation means in kinetic terms. Well, in kinetic terms, this means something very simple. In kinetic terms, this equation means that beta epsilon satisfies a kind of Lasov equation. And the Lasov equation looks like this. Did I write VP epsilon? I should write EB epsilon for this internal quantum. That looks great again, right? I mean, again, it, rem it reminds you, or it is very reminiscent of the classical Vlasov equation of, 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 of the Vlasov equation of classical mechanics. And keep in mind, formally, formally, this term is order epsilon squared. So when you drop it, you just get back the Vlasov equation, which is the well-known, well-established uh, semi-classical limit of quantum mechanics. Now, I'm really cheating you in there. I'm cheating you in the following sense. Well, I mean, this is a precise statement. I mean, this measure theoretic push forward statement. But it is not clear that this equation really makes sense. In the sense of, I mean, in order to be able to mathematically rigorously write down this equation, you have to explain what this product can be. And of course, I mean, you can take the, the, the psi derivative out, and it would be enough to, to, to uh, uh, understand what this product means. But this is very complicated. Let me just reiterate that Vp epsilon is minus epsilon square half Laplace square root of rho epsilon divided by square root. And again, there is no regularity issue here. It's a co I mean, on rho itself, there is a, an issue of rho becoming zero. Okay? And it's not really clear what these terms, what this product here means. 
But I mean, I, I just want to keep this equation as a kinetic sideline for the following. It's just an interesting interpretation. OK. Uh, maybe one more comment is in order. Uh, if you look at this system of ordinary differential equations, well, of course, there is, uh, again, some cheating involved here, because the right-hand side depends on the position density rho epsilon at time t. Okay, but still I have nowhere the wave function entering here. So what you could just say is that you found a formulation of quantum mechanics which in some sense is independent of the wave function. Now how can you solve this problem? This is a highly non-linear, non-local problem of course, right? But what you can think of is you solve your ODE system, say on a small time interval, and then you sample rho. And how, how, how do you sample rho? Well, through the push-forward formula. Then you, again, you integrate sample. And this is precisely what people do when they ray trace numerically. So numerical ray tracing for quantum mechanics can be done completely independently of the Schrodinger equation. This is, in some sense, philosophically a, a, a striking thing. Mathematically, I don't really know how strong it is. Anyway. And this ray tracing is, of course, you can also read it through the kinetic <coughs> equation. Yeah? So I think the only important thing was here to define the Bohmian measure in the correct way. OK. Oops. Now, what is the point that I want to get to? For which I have only 10 more minutes or so. The point is that I'm really interested in what happens in the limit as epsilon tends to zero. Now, uh, I mean, among mathematicians, I can phrase it in a somewhat strong way. I mean, we were sort of interested in whether Bohm's formulation of quantum mechanics can survive in the classical limit. And we do not have a complete answer to that yet, but my preliminary answer, which I'm, uh, I'm going to try to substantiate for you here now in the remaining 10 minutes, is that the answer is no. Okay. Okay. But for this, I mean, it's, it's, it's clear that I have to study the limit as epsilon tends to zero of monokinetic measures of this form. Okay. All right. So let's get into this. And there is one thing about the Schrodinger equation which I didn't tell you yet, and that is conservation of energy. And conservation of energy simply reads in the following form. Uh, well, this is the total energy, and this is a constant. So this is equal to the initial energy, and for the following, I assume that this is uniformly bounded by some constant as epsilon tends to zero. So in particular, this means that I have a bound on epsilon gradient psi epsilon uh, uniformly now. OK. Now, from, if I have such a wave function, then what you can prove immediately is that rho epsilon will tend weakly in measure to some limiting measure. You prove which is a positive measure, of course, that J epsilon tends weakly in the limit to assigned measure uh, J zero. Uh, then you can prove that uh, J zero is absolutely continuous with respect to rho zero, but these are all trivial facts. But you can also prove that beta epsilon tends to some limiting measure beta zero. This is a, just a question of uniform boundedness of the measure. By compact. And actually here I should say, after extraction of subsequences, of course. Right? Because these are compact as arguments. OK. Uh, now, in order to describe classical limits of quantum mechanics, uh, we, I mean, we already know an object, which is the Wigner transform. The Wigner transform of the wave function. Now, I don't want to write down explicitly what the Wigner transform of the wave function is. Let me just say that, well, it's again a phase space function, and you can prove that this phase space function in the limit as epsilon tends to zero uh, converges to a positive 
phase space measure. Okay, and this positive phase space measure satisfies precisely the Vlasov equation. So in order to understand whether Bohmian measures, uh, whether Bohmian uh, formulation of quantum mechanics survives in the classical limit, I have to argue whether W0 is equal to beta 0 or not. So this is the main question that I have to answer. Uh, okay, so, well, first of all, I should say that I'm grateful to Marshall for introducing young measures, which kind of made my my life simple, and it means that I only have to run 10 minutes over time. Uh, well, the first result that we can prove is the following. Although the Bohmian measure is a monokinetic phase space measure, this is not all, I mean, this property is not kept in the, is generally not kept in the limit as epsilon tends to zero. Okay. And the first theorem that we can prove is this, that the Bohmian measure is bounded below by the following measure, uh, integral from zero to infinity, r to the t plus one, nu x of r and r p dr, where I have to tell you what nu x is. Nu x is the young measure of the sequence rho epsilon Okay, so I mean, it's kind of natural. Uh, you have your wave function, you have your initial, uh, you, you have your basic observables, you sort of can have a feeling for the limits. I mean, you said in most cases you can compute the limit, and you can compute these limits out of the Wigner function. And here you have a statement which connects the Bohm measure uh, to precisely the Young measure of the sequence, which basically. Well, controlling the Young measure, basically, as Marshall said, means that you have to control all, all nonlinear functions of the sequence. And of course, uh, this, after application, after you write this in the weak form, you just get a very particular form of nonlinear function that you need to control, nonlinear function of rho and j. Okay, uh, well, you would rather have an equal sign here. Okay, but the equal sign, you can prove, holds if uh, rho epsilon converges to rho zero in L1 strong. So basically, if you have no concentrations in the sequence. Okay, now one result that you can deduce from here immediately is the following that if rho epsilon converges to rho zero in L1 strongly, if j epsilon converges to j zero in measure, in measure and of course in in measure weak star, which are completely different notions of convergence, then you can prove that the limiting form measure is monokinetic. Okay, now, when you go into the theory of Wigner functions and Wigner measures, uh, what we know is the following. When you start the Schrodinger evolution with, with a wave function, which is in WKB form, then uh, the Wigner measure will be monokinetic, and it will be monokinetic as long as you don't have caustics in the hamilton jacobi equation. So that means as long as the hamilton jacobi equation has a smooth classical solution. Okay. Now, when when W zero is monokinetic, then basically this tells you precisely what happens before caustics. That before caustics, you have strong convergence. Okay, you have strong convergence of the wave function. You have strong convergence of observables. And basically, what you proved with this theorem is that before caustics, before the caustic onset, uh, Bohmian mechanics survives in the classical limit. And that means that the limiting Bohm measure, so beta zero is equal to W zero before caustic onset. Okay. Now, five, how much time do I have left? Two minutes or something. Okay, two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, and finally, let me give you a 
theorem which basically should convince you that after caustic onset this is not the case anymore and the theorem looks like the following the theorem says the following assume two properties property number one is that epsilon times the gradient of the square root of rho epsilon tends to zero in L2 locally. And this looks like an arbitrary term. It's actually not an arbitrary term. When you write the energy in WKD form, you see that this term uh, uh, comes up. Well, the second property is the following, that epsilon times the, uh, let me call it like this, that the supremum of all x of epsilon times the gradient of the velocity uh, tends to zero as epsilon tends to zero. So basically, this means that the, initial, that the velocity is not supposed to have oscillation. Sorry. Yes. Now, to be precise, this means that oscillations uh, in the velocity <coughs> only occur at scales larger than epsilon. Okay. Then the theorem says that W0 is equal to beta 0. This is one direction. The other direction, so the question is, of course, when is beta 0? So let me write it like this. Beta 0 is W0. What can I conclude from this? Right? This is a really important question. And I can prove you that the first property is sharp. So basically, if beta 0 is, w is equal to w0, then this quantity has to go to 0. This basically means that in gradient of rho epsilon, you cannot have oscillations on the scale smaller than epsilon. Now, as far as the second property is, 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 is concerned, we don't have a complete proof that it follows in the same way. But I can give you many examples where if this property is not satisfied, then uh, you, W0 is not equal to beta 0. So basically, uh, heuristically speaking, what the theory that I've just shown you tells you is that before caustics, everything is OK. You can do Wigner, you can do Bond. After caustics, basically one of these two properties is going to break down in your wave function. And then Bohm is not going to be equal to Wigner. Yeah. So 